Welcome to the Entree Pastors Podcast on YouTube. This is a show that helps pastors think, act, and thrive as prosperous entrepreneurs. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to this episode of the Entree Pastors Podcast. My name is John Sanders. I'm one of the co hosts of the show. And on today's episode, you are going to hear me and my partner in crime, Les Hughes. We're going to do an interview with Pastor Ryan Stoyer. And I'm so excited for you guys to meet Ryan and to hear his story. Ryan is what I would consider the epitome of what we're hoping to see happen again and again with entree pastors. We want to see pastors who are thriving in life, in the church, and in business. And that's exactly what Ryan is doing. He pastors a small church just outside of Indianapolis, and he has been very successful in business. He runs a nonprofit as well as a for-profit coaching business. Uh, Much of his community focuses on teachers and school administrators, and he's doing a phenomenal job in that area. And so again, I can't wait for you to hear his story about how he got into ministry and how he manages to balance his time in the church world as well as in business life and uh, and just is doing some amazing things. I also want you to know this, as you're hearing Ryan's story, I want you to know that Ryan is a member of our Entree Pastors membership community. And so if you join that membership, you're going to have access to pastors just like Ryan that you can rub shoulders with, you can ask them questions, you can learn from them and be surrounded by some people who are doing life, ministry, and business at a really high level. So again, without any further ado, let me get to this interview with Pastor Ryan Stoyer. Check this out. It is a pleasure to have you on the Entree Pastors podcast. On behalf of me and Les, welcome to the show, man. Oh, thanks, John. Thanks, Les. Super excited to be here. I've been listening, and I love it. Sweet. Well, hey, Ryan, let's let's just get right to work here. I'm going to ask you to give an introduction of yourself, uh, just kind of where you are in the world, the work that you do, and then we're going to do a deep dive into the ministry side. Then we'll switch over into the business side and we'll go from there. So introduce yourself to our audience, if you would, please. Sure. So I'm just outside of Indianapolis. I've got a beautiful wife, five kids. They've got 30 chickens. Uh, so we we pastor the this rural church right across the street from our house. You know, fifty percent of our church family walks to church uh, church services. I also run a nonprofit organization called Magnify Learning, about six hundred thousand dollars in revenue there uh, for the organization. And I also run a group called Leading for Legacy, where we do masterminds and we do coaching for educational leaders and entrepreneur leaders. Fantastic. So. We're going to circle back around to the business side of what you do, the entrepreneurial side of what you do, but you have a little bit of a unique story as as far as how you got into ministry. So tell us about how you became a pastor, and then I might ask you some more questions around the church side of things before we circle back to business. Sure. So I'll give you the the medium-sized story, if you will. So I, I graduated from Purdue and went to go work for a Fortune 50 company as an engineer. Um, and then after that, we cut that salary in half. I found Jesus while I was an engineer, right? So I came to Christ, um, changed a few things. And so I cut my salary in half to go work at an urban school, downtown Indianapolis. Um, my principal actually, after we signed on the contract, he said, so what kind of a pay cut is this for you, Ryan? We're glad you're here. But I said, do you really want to know, Mark? <laughs> so it's a 50% pay cut. So we did some great work. Um, there for about a decade, and then um, became local missionaries on the west side of Indianapolis and cut that salary in half again. And that's what my wife said, um, you can only cut this in half so many times and still have them pay your mortgage and feed your kids and that kind of thing. And I was, I was on a path to do what Jesus wanted me to do. And I thought that meant you know, moving away from business and, and a big salary. So I kept cutting in half, trying to get holier and holier. Um, but that was a big statement by my wife. So we found some other consulting uh, work in the education field um, that allowed us to be in a, a different spot. So then when the rural church across the street from our house opened up, we could become bivocational pastors. So the church had moved out. We talked to the owners. They said, well, we'll, we'll ask you to lease it. 
So, okay, what's that look like? They said a dollar a year. Yeah. All right, we're in, right? So our tithe and offering, we keep the lights on. You know, we're just going to reach out to our small community. And we grew from there. And because I'm bivocational, it allows us to, to service our community. So that was the part I wanted you to share. I wanted to highlight, but you just said some stuff I need to go back and, and uh, dig deeper into. The, the part I wanted to highlight was the fact that most pastors don't go into pastoral ministry because they saw a church building across the street open up, you know, and they say, hey, let's, let's start a church. So that's kind of a non-traditional, like, are you aware of that, that that's a non-traditional pathway into ministry for a lot of pastors? Is, or is this the first time you're hearing me, someone say <laughs> yeah. that? That might be the first one, John. So uh, <laughs> for me, you know, it it opened up and, you know, um, it just made sense. My wife even said while they were moving out, the church before us, and we'd been a couple of times, but, you know, when, when she calls me by my last name, I know something's going on. She goes, Stoyer, they're, they're moving out. You better get over there, right? Because we want to bloom where we're planted. We want to, you know, show people the, the love of Christ. Our na- We want to show our neighbors, right? So it's like, man, what an opportunity. So we did. We just kind of ran to it. Okay. So back up a little bit. You come to Christ later in life as an adult, and I wanted to know more about your your ministry experience from a vocational standpoint. I was curious if you had any other, like, had you ever served on staff at a church before you just opened up your own and, and started your own? Um, but now I have even more questions as you share that detail about, you know, you went from an engineer salary to a to a, a school teacher, like that was all, and I was going to ask, but you kind of connected the dots already. That was all in response to your new walk with Christ. Like you felt this was uh, something you were compelled to do, um, to, to move away from this high paying job into more of a, you know, ministry type career. And with that came a pay cut. And you mentioned something like that, you know, you kept getting holier and holier by cutting your paycheck. I mean, obviously at that point, to become completely holy, you also have to be completely broke based on that mindset. So somewhere along the way, that mindset shifted for you. And I'd love to hear a little bit of that journey. Like, where did you start to turn that around? Because I feel like a lot of people are there, you know, with that mindset of, you know, the less I have, the more righteous I am. So obviously you're, yeah. you're less holy today than you were back then based on that definition. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, based on that definition, I, I would be less holy. But um, you know that relationship with Christ is stronger than ever, and with my wife as well. You know, so I was, uh, you know, working, working for a Fortune 50 company, and the idea was to make more money. Right, that was the only real emphasis. I liked the work; it was challenging. I enjoyed it, um, but I was making a multi-billion-dollar company, millions of dollars. Like, so that mission didn't fully match up with what I saw as I was as I was chasing Jesus, and I was hungry. Um, so we, we jumped ship. I said, well, I, you know, I can help more people. You know, there's 125 kids in my class that are required by law to come interact with me. Right. So I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to build relationships. And so then we kept going down that path and, you know, our family was growing. So when we took that final pay cut to have $20,000, we had three kids at the time, um, and a mortgage. And to be real honest, the thought process was still, you know, we could sell this house. The house is all right, but for Christ, we'd sell it. Um, but as we were going through that, and then I saw, I grabbed an extra consulting job. And when I saw the freedom that I could have with that, that's really what changed things for me. It was, man, I don't have to be here from eight to five. You know, I can go do this work, you know, maybe up in you know Northern Indiana and drive back, but I could have Wednesday all open to do ministry, to be with my family, you know, to earn some more income. So that freedom is probably what opened it up for us, because then it was like, well, I have time freedom. What if we had money freedom? Then we could donate more to that missionary. And we started to see that path as a way to really serve the church and to serve the kingdom in a more powerful way than what, what were the path we were on. So where did you start to really build out then the, the profitable? I know you're in a, you have a nonprofit but it's it's profitable, right? Just because it's a nonprofit doesn't mean that you're making zero dollars from it. So where right. did that in that story, where did this start to become a profitable thing for you where you're starting to get back closer to where you were initially before you started cutting your salary in half? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, I got a thirty five thousand dollar consulting contract, right? And then it was like, here are the things you have to fulfill. And there were no time 
parameters on that, right? So if I got it all done in two weeks, I made 35 grand in two weeks. So that really shifted things. Uh, so even the nonprofit I run now, you know, I, I pull a six figure salary from that um, to go and do good work um, and to work with schools. And uh, we, we do amazing work, right? So it is a vehicle that I believe is still kingdom work, but I still have the flexibility in that position that I hold. I've got time freedom. I'm able to do other things, other outlets. Um, so really it's looking after things that give time freedom, um, you know, money freedom, uh, those types of freedoms that allow me to, I think, follow Christ more authentically to serve my family more authentically. Uh, so that's the path that we're on. Yeah. So coming back into the church side for just a moment, you, whether you realize it or not, are kind of on this non-traditional path into pastoral ministry. So you, you maybe didn't have to work through some of the mental uh, hurdles that, that many mm-hmm. in our audience would coming into a pastoral role because you've already had a level of success in the marketplace and you're doing some things there. So you, you're approaching, I guess, here's what, here's what I want our audience to hear, Ryan. I want them to hear some of the, the, the mindset that you have, because it's like, you don't know what you don't know. So it, and that's why I was kind of curious about your background in ministry or vocational ministry, because I would love for more pastors to have healthy boundaries between their work that they do in church and then work they do beyond the church, both for the sake of extending the gospel and making an income for their own family. Um, But like, you didn't have to fight through all of this stuff. You didn't have to fight through this mental baggage of being a full-time pastor. You kind of did it backwards. You kind of came from a a full-time, you know, successful career in the marketplace. And now I'm adding the pastoral thing. We're primarily talking to pastors that are full-time pastors that we're trying to help them add some kind of marketplace thing. So maybe speak into that. I might hit you with, or have less hit you with some more questions around that too, of just that tension. But how do you approach that now that you've got a foot planted still firmly in the, the ministry you do in the marketplace, but now the ministry you do in the church as well? Like, How do you manage that? Yeah, I think this is a great place to take us. Uh, I think it'll serve the audience well. So I came into you know, starting this church and my family's welfare, well-being was not dependent on that church or the salary that we may or may not receive from there. So the previous church had had closed the doors because there was one family that can, that really contributed the majority of the funds, therefore paid the pastor. And eventually folks didn't want to be a part of that, right? Because that one family was running the whole church. I was 100% committed to that never happening in the church that we're a part of. Because I, if, if you want to take us some personal direction that you think the church should go, and that's not where myself and the leadership and we believe the Holy Spirit's taking us, you can leave. Mm. And my well-being and my family's well-being is not in any way at risk. So the authenticity that I felt we could bring, the integrity that we could bring by not being dependent on someone giving or not giving, I think has has really helped us blossom. And we've had a few people that have come and decided to leave because they didn't like the way things were done. They didn't like the color of the carpet or the pews or that kind of thing. And that's fine, right? This is the direction we believe that Jesus has taken us. And and so it took a it took a variable off the table for us that we did not have to worry about that portion. Yeah. Do you now? Do you get paid by the church? Can I ask that? Do you receive any kind sure. of salary from the church? We get a housing allowance. Okay. So, yeah, and and again, I I personally have no issue with that. I feel like if you're con- contributing significant hours or you know uh, results that you're producing for a church, I I totally am fine with the pastor still receiving a paycheck for that, you know, just to be blunt. But so how do you balance that expectation? Well, first, let me ask this. Do you feel that expectation? Do you, have you felt that, that sense of, you know, people have this maybe primarily unspoken, sometimes spoken expectation of pastor. We, we want you here like all the time. We want to know that my pastor's on call. Like the, I put out the bat signal and Batman shows up. Like, do you, do you yeah. feel that in your context? We don't. I mean, I talk about it openly, right? I've I've got other jobs that I do, and I leverage it from the idea that 
Ryan knows some things about the Bible. Um, I believe that I've been called to speak here at our church um, and to our church family, but I've got a job just like you guys do, right? So as much as I read the Bible, you could read the Bible and do the same thing and know a lot of the same things I know. So I've kind of put it more towards a challenge towards our church family of, you know, I don't sit you know, in an office all day, just researching for a sermon. I've got appointments. I've got meetings I need to go to. I've got a staff. And then, yes, I, I make sure that I have time in my life for a study and to help run the church. And one other piece that helps us is we do believe that our mission field is local. So I do some ministry when I take out the garbage and then I see my neighbors taking out the garbage. We stop, we connect, we do some ministry. Um, if I need to check on Pat, who's up the street, it takes me five minutes to walk up there and do that. Um, so that that's how we balance some of those things. Have you experienced any pushback from people? Uh, I'm in a rural context as well, so I I can I don't know what rural Indiana looks like, but I can imagine in rural South Dakota, if a pastor were to to talk openly about you know being very successful in business outside of the church world, how that may not be super celebrated. So are, are people aware of how successful you are in the marketplace and, and do they ever push back on that or challenge that in any way? I don't know if they're a hundred percent aware, but for the most part, they are, um, you know, we don't hide anything. Like we've got a real nice travel trailer that we pull around the country. And, um, you know, I mentioned the book that I wrote, the organization I run, I, I do preach in a t-shirt, jeans and cowboy boots. Right. So, you know, again, I'm nobody calls me. There's one one family that calls me Pastor Ryan. Everybody else calls me Ryan. Right. It's, you know, how can we all experience Christ together? Um, so th- there's never been any pushback towards that. So speak to that pastor that's listening to this right now, because, again, this is almost I feel like you're almost a, a reverse model, like I said earlier, of of maybe the, the the pathway in. So you came from marketplace into you know more of a traditional ministry setting, even though you're not doing it in a traditional way. But what would you what advice would you give to that pastor that's hearing this right now, going, Ryan, I'd love to have some, some income on the side that's bringing in six figures and providing time freedom and financial freedom, but I. Right now, I work full time and I get paid, you know, forty thousand dollars a year to, mm-hmm. you know, to punch sixty hours on the time clock every week with, and still have people grumbling that I'm not doing enough. You know, how, what advice would you give them to cross over from where, the, without just completely quitting? Because that's where I feel like many pastors are just, mm-hmm. I'm just done. Yeah. I'm just done, and they they just quit. But is there a way? And and if so, how do they cross over where they still have a foot in the church world? doing that ministry there, but also exploring and growing success in business beyond the church? That's a great question. Like you said, I'm, I'm kind of the reverse of that. So I don't know if I'll speak into that well, but uh, for, for me, like as I bring these things to our church family, I mean, it all comes from my relationship with Jesus, right? Like I'm not, there isn't a prideful piece where I say, look, Ryan did this, right? It's, you know, I'm following Christ and where I believe he's calling me to do, to do that good work. And then I, I see that blessing of freedom in the gospel. So I, I think your own mindset might be a great place to start, that you're okay with that, saying, hey, if I earn some extra money, that I'd be okay with that. And then maybe finding an elder or a leader to confide in and say, hey, here's what I'm thinking. Does this make sense to you? What I find is because I have had some apprehension, you know, should everybody know that I'm investing in real estate? Should everybody know that, you know, we're, we're closing on this apartment complex and these types of things? Because I don't want to seem prideful, especially from the pulpit um, or inside conversations. But what I find is every time I reveal some of these pieces, people are excited for me. Right? They love yeah. that my family's blessed by these things. They love that we have the freedom that, I mean, honestly, if, if, if we have an expense that the church can't cover then we can cover that, right? Like there's a portion that they see that freedom. They know that I'm sold out for Jesus and they're for me every time I bring that up. So um, I I think we might hold some of that back ourselves, right? Like what if you did reveal that to again, find a trusted friend. I'm not saying next Sunday you go out and proclaim, Hey, I'm going to go make six figures on the side, but you know, start with yourself in prayer 
And then, right. And, and once you're comfortable with some of that, go to a trusted leader and say, Hey, what do you think? You know, I've been listening to this podcast. I've been listening to Les and John and some of this makes sense, right? What do you think? What if, and you know, maybe you've got a business leader that's there. They'd be all for that. No. Oh. So hey, I, I think hey, it's not as big a hurdle. I don't think as we think maybe. Yeah. Could I ask something real quick, John? Yeah. Ryan, what you just said is, um, is so profound that I want to see if you can just kind of peel it back a, a few layers of it, because, you know, as, as we know, that's not the mindset of some pastors. They would love to get to the place where you just described, but there's a, there's a belief in themselves that they don't have, but they need to get there first. So as a part of that, it could be helpful just for people to know a little bit about what, what your everyday, what your life experience is now, what your relationship to your family is, even your re- relationship with the Lord. Now that there's not as much anxiety related to living, you know, paycheck to paycheck. So take yourself back to Ryan a few years ago and Ryan now, just in terms of overall health, you know, soul health and family health compared to what it was. Man, that, that gives me goosebumps last. That, that's such a great question. I mean, so if I take you back a couple of years, when I first started and I made this shift, I'm a local missionary. Um, I'm starting Magnify Learning. I've got a consulting gig on the side. I'm leading young adult leadership at a large church. And I come home and I park, pull, pull, in, pull it in reverse, right? And I just stop. My day's over. So I stop and put my head back, right? And I fall asleep for what, 30 minutes? My wife comes out. Did you just fall asleep? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, you know, I'd just been driving, doing all my stuff. Wow. I fell asleep. I was just exhausted yeah. to the point where I got home and I did the, the sigh of my days done and just zonked out. And that was a big piece of like, there's no way we can do this forever, right? There's no way that this works. So you fast forward that my day today, um, I'll have bre- I had breakfast and, and lunch with my family today. Uh, I do that most days, most days, breakfast, lunch, and dinner I have with my family. I put that in my schedule. Um, I'll be over at the church as needed. I volunteer at the food pantry with my kids because I think that's important for us to go and serve together. Um, you know, I've got sermon prep built into my week. Uh, I've got uh, you know, a morning time where I'm with, with the Lord and in the word and, and praying through things. I've got times where I'm sitting down with my wife um, and, and I look forward, right? It's a lot of visionary work um, that I'm putting in because I've got time to do that, right? I sleep enough. I slept eight hours last night, right? Because I can, it's awesome. right? And, and so I'm taking care of myself. I exercise, I'm eating right. You know, I'm I've got those things built into my budget and into my day that provide freedom for me and my family, right? Like those 30 chickens don't make us any money, <laughs> but, but I feed them monthly, right? But it gives the kids responsibility. They've got a business, right? They sell those eggs. So they make money on it. It costs me money, but it allows me to do that. Otherwise, goodness, I'm, who knows what I'm spending a month feeding chickens that right now aren't even producing eggs. So, yeah. so but it gives me the freedom to do that and, uh, and a lot of ministry comes out of that, honestly. I want to ask you something, if I could, about church leadership regarding that. And John, you've probably seen this too. I know you coach a lot of pastors. And sometimes, especially in congregations where you have more professionals or white collar people, maybe some fairly assertive, strong willed leaders, sometimes they see the pastor as almost almost a seminary student and you know that that never graduates in the sense that they would never really uh, go to him for counsel on personnel or budget or operations those kinds of things that they feel like a more quote, marketplace skills, you know, Mm -hmm. I would suspect that that is not the case with you because you bring a lot of savvy to the table when it comes to those categories. What have you noticed in terms of how the church looks to you in those areas? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the church will, for the most part, let me run with those things, right? The leadership, we, we get to talk about those things and, and plan for the future and, yeah, again, I might not know some of the traditional path portions, but we don't have any of that stuff. Like I'm in every one of those conversations to to push things along. 
um, to, to move that vision forward. So there, there's no peace there. Um, the reason I'm asking that. Side. Yeah, and the reason I ask is because I know that we've got some people that are some younger pastors, especially that are mm-hmm. listening to this, that the church just doesn't respect them in that area because they don't believe that they have a lot of experience. And one of the things that John and I have talked about in terms of the benefits of being an entree pastor is that really without without having that as an agenda necessarily the church can see success in those other areas and not treat the pastor in sort of a patronizing way, like pastor, you just get rid for Sunday and we'll take care of the business of the Mm -hmm. church. That is the way that a lot of them feel, but to the detriment of the church, a lot of times. Well, I love that. And that's why I love this community is if, you know, if somebody can start a side business, you know, if they've been seminary pastor and you start a side business, you get to know business. So now you can talk the talk and you've got more confidence in that conversation, right? You say, well, you know, when I'm coaching people or when I'm, you know, paying staff or whatever that is, now you're bringing those experiences in and you've got more confidence in that situation. Yeah, for sure. Good. Well, Ryan, what I love about your story is, and and like so many that we're going to continue to share on this podcast, is that it's possible. I think that's one of the the first things that I want the average pastor that's listening to this out there to know. It is possible. Other people are doing this. And if Ryan Stoyer can do it, I can do it too. It doesn't matter that you kind of came at it from a different angle and your story might be just slightly different than the quote traditional pastor's route into ministry. It's still possible. Here's a guy who is serving a church really well out of the abundance and overflow and margin of his relationship with the Lord, his family, mm-hmm. he's serving his church and his community. And he's also serving people through his entrepreneurial businesses and he's, he's thriving in life and ministry. And that's really what our heart and, and goal is for pastors in this community. I Well, first of all, I'm, I'm going to, in just a minute, invite you to kind of step backstage with us here in this interview and share one more uh, piece of content. But before we sign off, I just want to ask if you're comfortable with it, if, if someone that's listening to this wanted to reach out and connect with you, first of all, are you okay with that? And secondly, how, how would they go about contacting you if they wanted to drill deeper into your story? 100%. I would, I would love uh, to share any of the details, the numbers, skill sets, experiences, people, any of those pieces. Uh, actually, if any of your listeners go to leadingforlegacy.com, so Leading for Legacy, and that's a platform I use. I think everybody's best work, including yours, John and Les, it's 10 years out, mm-hmm. right? And your kids are get they're growing as well, and you shouldn't miss your best work or the be- this best time with your kids. That's great. Well, uh, we're going to sign off the first part of the interview right here. And uh, before we do, though, I'm just going to give a little teaser for uh, the backstage content. And I'll say this much on on this side of uh, the curtain, if you will. Recently, Ryan, I heard you make a statement in a mastermind group that you and I are both in. Uh, you made this statement, and, and I'll paraphrase it. You can say it differently, and then we'll go deeper into the story uh, backstage. But you made the statement that really for you came to a, a realization that you've never really tried to build wealth. And is that a fair summary of what you said? I mean, feel free to put it in your own it, words. It is. You know, I've never really, I've never tried to build wealth. I and mean, the more I've thought about legacy and kind of my work, um, there's a lot of value there. And since I've said that, um, I can certainly share some results from that, that time. Mindset is yeah. such a big deal. Yeah, and that's what we're going to drill down into in the the backstage content. So, Ryan, thank you so much for being a part of this community, being one of our early guests to come on and and share your story. And I really believe that your story will encourage and empower other pastors to take the next step forward in their entree pastor journey. So, thank you so much, my friend. Absolutely. Thanks for thanks for uh, having me on, and thanks for this work. It's good stuff. Thanks, Ryan. Well, hey, thanks for watching this episode of the Entree Pastors Podcast. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can be notified every time we release a new episode. If you'd like to get connected to other pastors who are learning to think, act, and thrive as prosperous entrepreneurs, then we invite you to check us out on Facebook. Just search for the Entree Pastors Connect group, answer a few of our simple questions there, and we'd love to include you in the conversations. And if you're really ready to go to the next level, then we invite you to join our Entree Pastors membership community. 
When you become a monthly subscriber, you will receive access to courses, exclusive community, and coaching that will help you along in your own Entree Pastors journey. If there's anything else we can do to serve you, please visit us at EntrePastors.com and we will do our best to serve you there. God bless everybody. See you soon. Mm -hmm.